The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. We're going to officially welcome our podcast audience, our YouTube audience, and our Facebook Live audience. Today, I'm going to be dealing with the topic, again, that is very controversial among all circles of Christianity, Charismatics, Pentecostals, formal, whatever the case may be. What will happen to the church after the raptures? Many believers around the world believe in what many theologians have coined as the rapture of the church. Uh, and before we lose, uh, before we lose any kind of ground on this, don't get caught up on the word rapture itself, because many people's argument is that the word rapture is nowhere to be found in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. Well, listen, guys, uh, that argument alone doesn't hold much water, being that there's many terms that we throw around in every form of charismatic Pentecostal and Christian circles, such as millennial reign, such as tr Trinity. Uh, there's several words, even the word demon comes from the Greek demonized and is really not found in the original translation, but we've added these words. Having said that, you can call this event the catching away, the gathering together, or you can call it what the Greek word itself is, what is called harpezo, meaning to seize or to snatch away. Now, I want to give you, uh, even though there is not no reference to this in the Old Testament per se, there is what I call parallels or depictions or pictures of this event. So I don't want to go into the Old Testament of this because, again, that would take a lot more time than what I wanted to, to spend on this. But let me stick to the New Testament of the Bible and show you two main scriptures that are the greatest evidence of this event that is, again, a very controversial event. First of all, let's go to the First Thessalonians Chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. By the way, the Apostle Paul wrote both of these scriptures, and it was the Apostle Paul who, got, I believe, got the full revelation of this event that we're talking about today. It was one of the seven mysteries that he himself received when he was alone in the presence of the Lord, and he began to write about it in his letters especially to the church of Thessalonica and to the church of Corinth. Okay, so let's get into 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Here, this is written to the church of Thessalonica. The apostle Paul wrote, quote, for the Lord himself will descend <clears throat> from heaven. In other words, he's going to come down with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. So this event is going to be associated with a shout from the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and it will be the voice of God himself. And this event will cause the Lord himself to come down out of heaven. And listen what it says. And this event will be associated with the dead in Christ rising first. So the Lord comes down and the dead go up. And then we who are alive and remain. So Paul tells the church of Thessalonica here that at the time of, the, of, of this event taking place, there will be a group of people in the earth that will be alive and not dead. And listen what he says. And he says, those who are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's that word Harpezo in Greek, caught up, caught away, gathered together, caught up together with them. Who is them? Them, again, the law of first mention when you interpret scripture, the them in this context is the dead in Christ. So there's this, watch this, there's the voice of an archangel, there's a shout, there's a trumpet. And the Lord comes down, the dead go up, and then we, or those who are, will be alive and breathing on the earth and that are faithful in the Lord, serving him and watching for his coming, will be caught up 
together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now stop. Notice the Lord never put his foot on the earth. He didn't put his, in this scripture right here, I'm, I'm in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. And nowhere in the scripture did the Lord put his foot upon a mountain. He didn't put it upon a hill. He didn't put it in a temple and he didn't put it on the ground or he didn't put it in earth. It says that he will still be in the air. That's very important when I get to this next part in just a second. So, so this event, the Lord will come down. He will stay in the air. And this event will take place where the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And listen what the Apostle Paul says. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. So we here is the church. Somebody say, we are the church. And notice it says that we, from that point on, will be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Stop. If there was no such event here that's described in detail, first of all, by the Apostle Paul, then why did the Lord permit it to be written in the scriptures of the 66 books of the, uh, of the Bible? It's included in the Canaan of Scripture in the New Testament. Because after all, if all scripture is given by God and given by inspiration of God, and, and this event was false, and this event was a, a falsehood, or it was uh, fabricated, or it was later included, Included, then wouldn't you think that the Lord would have not permitted or allowed the Apostle Paul to write this to the church of Thessalonica, thus be put into the book of Thessalonians? Okay, that's the first argument. Number two, if this event was a falsehood, then why did Paul say comfort one another with these words? What words? The words of this event. All right, but then I want to go to the first Corinthians. Again, the Apostle Paul wrote this book as well, and it's to a different church. It's to the church of Corinth. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Again, this the rapture of the church is a mystery. And you know what I love about mysteries? Mysteries can be solved. The Bible says that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. Did you know that the Bible says that those who come to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him? Did you know that if you will ask, seek and find that you will receive, that you will find it and the door shall be, uh, the, uh, shall be open unto you? So in other words, God desires us to pursue him, to chase him, to desire him. And Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And that word sleep here in the Greek original language, me, it's an idiom meaning we shall not all die. Again, he didn't contradict himself. He agreed with the first, with what he just told the church of Thessalonica. What did he tell them? He said, there's coming an event and the dead's going to rise first, but there's going to be another group of people that will not see physical death, but they shall be caught up to meet them. So then he goes over to, to the church of Corinth and he says, I'm going to tell you a mystery. We shall not all die. But we shall all be changed in a moment, a tomos, and in, in a second, and a tomos second, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. There we go again. He mentions trumpets. He mentions an event that will change us in a twinkling of an eye that will involve a trumpet. But he says, not just any Trump. He said, it will be the last Trump. I believe, I told you I wasn't going to go too much in the Old Testament on this, but I absolutely 110% am convinced and believe. And by the way, again, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a theological difference of opinion. I believe when we all get to heaven, we're going to be shocked by what we didn't understand and what we didn't know and what we thought knew was absolute and wasn't. That goes for both sides of the camp. But I believe this is not 
the last trumpet mentioned in Revelation, but I believe this last trump is tied to a one of the seven major feasts of Israel called the Feast of Trumpets in which, watch this, there's a series or cessation of trumpets that's blown during that feast. And each one of those trumpet blasts means certain things. And there's what's the last and final trump that's blown is called in Hebrew, the Tekiah Hagadolah, and it means to gather together. Now you say, well, Brother Ricky, why are you convinced that that's what Paul was relating to or what he was depicting here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 through 53? The answer is simple, in my opinion, and that is the audience in which he is speaking to is predominantly Jewish and not Gentile. Therefore, he doesn't need to explain in the context what the last trump or last trumpet means, because if you've got all Jews there, they religiously practice the seven feasts of Israel. And when he says the last trump will sound, they come on, because this was written before John the Revelator wrote the book of Revelation and mentioned and got the revelation of the four angels blowing the four trumpets in the last trumpet come on this was written this letter written to the church of corinth was written before that so therefore the audience in which he was speaking to he did not have to clarify to them what he was discussing or what he was talking about because they understood these feasts and they said okay ah uh, I could really get deeper with that but I want to stay with this in first Corinthians 15 51 through 53 listen he says for the trumpet will sound he says the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, listen to this, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Again, this absolutely agrees with 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, where Paul said that when this event happens, the dead shall rise first. All right. He says the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. How are we going to be changed? Because we are going, listen, he tells you. For the corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, at the let me give you the differences between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, believers will meet the Lord in the air. I just gave you that first less first Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. At the second coming, however, but the believers, or I would say the church, will return with the Lord to the earth. Now, let me give you the scriptures for that. Revelation 19. Let me read this. Revelation 19, 14. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 13 and 14. He, and the speaking of the Lord, was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And listen to this, the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, let me go to the book of Jude, which is the book, the last book before the book of Revelation. Let me read what Jude says here. He says in verse 14, because there's only one book or one chapter in Jude. So it's in verse 14. And now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men saying, behold, listen to this. The Lord comes with, with <clears throat> ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all. So watch this. At the rapture. The church, the remnant, those who are awaiting his coming, looking for his return, his coming, who have been found faithful, overcomers, will meet him in the air. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. But at the second coming, when the Lord comes back out of heaven, the church comes with him. Now, watch this. The rapture occurs before the tribulation. Let me read this. First Thessalonians. Give me a second to turn there, guys. First Thessalonians. Um, 
I want to, I've got my Bible today because I want to turn there physically. Sometimes I do this. First Thessalonians 5, 9, listen to this. First Thessalonians 5, 9, for, quote, for God, by the way, this is the apostle Paul, the same one who wrote the revelation on the rapture. For God <clears throat> did not appoint us. Who's the, who's the us in this context? The church. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> what, is the what is the tribulation? The tribulation is the judgment, or I like to say the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. The vile judgments, the bold judgments, the trumpet judgments, all these things are <clears throat> the, the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. Let me go to the book of Jude. Now, for all the opponents of this who say, no, 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 brother, the church is going to be here for the tribulation and they are going to suffer the wrath of God with the unbelievers. Well, listen to this. Let me go back to what Jude said. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who were ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, mouthing great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Listen to this. Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you, listen to this, that there would be mockers in the last days who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. And again, Peter says, there will be mockers in the last days and they will say, where is the promise of his comings? Friend, Listen to me. The Lord is coming back out of heaven as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's coming to execute judgment, not on the church. Guys, if you are born again and you are saved and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, according to my Bible, we have, come on, we have been transferred from death unto life. We are no longer, come on, we are no longer the objects of the wrath of God. We are, Read Romans chapter 1. Judgment of God is coming upon all unrighteousness and those who practice things. My friends, the church and ungodly Sinners, wicked people, blasphemers, mockers, abominable people, you cannot put them in the same category. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit, in my opinion. At the, listen, the rapture, therefore, occurs before the tribulation. Revelation, I gave you 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Let me, let me give you Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm trying to turn here as quick as I can. Uh, Bear with me for a second. Revelation 3. Let me read this. Revelation 3, verse 10. Revelation 3, verse 10. Because <clears throat> you have kept my command to preserve, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, stop. Again, opponents to this will say, no, 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 no. That was written to one specific church and not the world. Well, don't you think they should have changed the wording? After all, the Bible, let me read that again really slow because Jesus said, listen to this. You have kept my command to preserve. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, the whole world. This is not just a group of people in the church, guys. This is, he's talking overcomers and the body of Christ. All right. So now let me go over here. Uh, listen to this <clears throat> first. All right. So the rapture occurs before the tribulation. The second coming occurs after the great 
tribulation, Revelation chapter 6 and 19. So let's go there, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter or Revelation chapter 6 through 19. I'm not going to read all that, but you can read all that whole from Revelation 6 all the way on. By the way, the church is not mentioned from Revelation. Let me go back over here. Revelation chapter 4, where John says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Hmm. Speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. After this. So watch this. There is a door is open. There's a voice. This, this sounds like a trumpet, and the words come up here are spoken. And then John gets a revelation that once there's a voice, once there's a uh, once there's a voice as a trumpet, there's a door open in heaven, and in the spirit we're caught up. Then things happen afterward. And then if you go to Revelation chapter 5 and on, the church is nowhere to be found. Why? Because I'm getting ready to show you why. Listen, all right? The rapture could take place at any moment. I can show you in, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus said, beware lest that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come, in Luke 21, he says, it will come as a snare upon the whole earth. But you, the church, but you walk sound-mindedly. Do not be weighed down with carousing and the cares of this life that that day come upon you unexpectedly. But the second coming of Christ will occur at the fullness of times and when all things that have been prophesied shall take place. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 through 30, Revelations chapter 6 through 18. Listen, the rapture is imminent and can take place at any moment again, but the second coming has been foretold and there's events that lead up to that. Now, Here's the question. What will happen to the church after we are caught up or we are gathered together? Ready? The next thing that happens, this is exciting, guys. We are spared from the horror and the tribulation that shall come upon the whole earth. Now, let me give you scriptures for that. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, again, if <clears throat> this is one of the arguments I get all the time. Well, you know, that rapture theory and that rapture doctrine is nothing but pure escapism. You, you know what? You're right. It is, and it's ex and and Jesus pr prayed and told us to pray in Luke twenty one thirty six. He said to watch and pray that we, the church, might be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and stand before the Son of Man. And again, I gave you First Thessalonians five nine. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to attain. His salvation to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 3.10, because we keep his command and preserve, he will keep us from the hour of testing that shall come upon the whole earth. And then in Nahum, it says that God's, God's speaking through the prophet Nahum, and he says that God is appointed, his, or God reserves his wrath for his enemies. Again, guys, the, the, the whole, the, the tribulation, the wrath of God being poured out. Do you know who that's being poured out on? The enemies of God. And if you hey, listen, so why in the world would God, why would the Lord put his bride in the midst of his enemies? It doesn't make sense, guys. Why would the Lord pour out his wrath upon his bride? I don't know about you. Listen, I've been married for 21 years this year. This year will make, in November will be 21 years and I'm going to tell you, I don't beat my bride. 
I don't treat my bride the same way I do an individual who I would consider to be an enemy or a foe or an unbeliever. I don't, again, and that's speaking from natural terms. And we, the church, the ecclesia is the bride of Christ. I'm telling you, I don't know what God you serve, but the God I serve is not a wife beater. He doesn't mistreat, beat, or pour out his wrath upon his own wife. But here's what, listen, here's the, here's what's um, exciting here. When the rapture takes place, we, for a moment, for a period of time, we will be in heaven, standing before the Lord, and we as the church will then stand before what is called the beam of judgment of the believer. This is where rewards will be handed out. The Bible talks about that. Every man's work will be judged and will be tried by fire. Some wood, hay, and stubble, some silver, some gold, some will preserve, some will survive. Uh, some will, uh, their works will not survive, but they will not be consumed. So they won't have anything to cast out. Now, what is, and then the Bible talks about, we will take our crowns and we will cast them before the Lord. Then the church, let me go over to Revelation 19. Let me tell you another glorious event that's going to happen. Now, all this is, we're at, watch this, the church is in heaven. So what's going on down on the earth? I'm with, you want to know what's going on down in the earth? Read Revelation chapter 5, verse Revelation 6, Revelation 7, Revelation 8. You've got the Antichrist comes to full power because the restrainer has been taken out of the way. And Paul wrote to, to the church of Thessalonica, and he says, you now know what restrains him that when he is taken out of the way, he, talking about the man of sin, the man of perdition, the Antichrist, will be revealed in his time. So the, the church is hard pesos, they're taken out of the way, and now the Antichrist is coming to full power, the false prophets come into power, working with him, you've got the mark of the beast system that's taking place, you've got all hell, excuse me, breaking loose on the earth. People are having to take this mark or this number or the name of the beast in their right hand or their forehead. You've got, I'm talking about, you've got celestial events taking place. You've got earthquakes happening. You've got bitter waters. You've got volcanoes erupting. You've got plagues coming, boils coming, locusts are coming out of the earth. You've got all this stuff happening. So where is the church in all this? We are not there in the earth. We are in heaven standing before the beam of judgment. And then you know what else takes place while we're in heaven it's called the glorious marriage supper of the lamb and you can find that in revelation 19 verses 6 through 9 it says and i heard as it were the voice of a great multitude the sound of many waters is the sound of mighty thunderings saying alleluia for the lord god omnipotent reigns let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife by the way that's the bride, that's us, has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Guys, li listen, martyrism and shedding your blood is not what qualifies you to, in, to get entrance to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What qualifies you and what gains you access to the marriage supper of the Lamb is being born again and having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. There's a lot of people that teach that in order for you to get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, you've got to shit. Come on, blood's got to fly. You've got to die. Your head's got to roll. you got to make it, endure through the tribulation, and then you'll make it into the marriage supper of the Lamb. No, we make it into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Your ticket to get into heaven, your ticket to get into the Lamb's book of life, your ticket to get to the marriage supper of the Lamb is you repenting and getting your heart right with God and accepting him as your Lord and savior. That is what gets you access.
It's come on. It's not by good works. It's not by denomination. It's not by the traditions of your mama, your daddy, and whatever church organization you came up. It is through the blood of Jesus, through repentance. Now, that's what happens to the church. Then the wrath of God's being poured out upon the earth through the tribulation. Then, then, when the appointed time has come, the Lord comes back out of heaven with, come on, with the church. I just read to you earlier, the book of Jude talks about that. Revelation 19 talks about that. And he comes down and he sets up his kingdom, come on, on earth and establishes it for his thousand year reign. Satan is bound for a thousand years. And eventually when it's all said, I don't want to break this down after a thousand years, Satan is loosed. And I don't want to get in all that because it would take another 45 minutes to develop all that message. But when we get all the way to the end of this thing, let me tell you something. And this is, this is scary. And I don't want anybody listening by podcast or watching by YouTube or watching by Facebook to stand before this judgment. There's coming what's called the great white throne judgment, which will take place uh, with the church no longer in the earth because we are now preserved with the Lord. So we're preserved. We're, uh, we're marked by God, but listen to this. Here's what it says in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw, John the Revelator wrote this in Revelation. He said, I saw a great white throne and in him who sat on it from from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So this is after the tribulation. This is is when when all this thing comes to the end. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. By the way, we did a whole message one time called the five books of heaven that you may not know about. You can find that archived on YouTube somewhere. The sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works. Listen to this. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Listen, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that my friends is where I want to close this podcast today, but here's where I want to leave it today. Again, just to be safe, I don't, you never know who's listening, never know who's watching. Every single person under the sound of my voice today, whether you're whatever platform you're listening or watching from, you and I are going to stand before either one of these two judgments. Either you're going to be standing before the beam of judgment in heaven because you have been, you are an overcomer. You've overcome. You've walked uprightly before the Lord. You've, uh, you've lived your life to serve him. You've lived a life of repentance. I'm not saying you lived a life of perfection. You've lived a life of repentance because the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you were gonna, you are part of the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the church. And I pray, just as Jesus said, I pray that we're found worthy. That's me too, guys. I pray that we are found worthy to escape all these things that are coming, that are that are coming. And by the way, they are unfolding before our eyes right now. We're I don't we're not in the tribulation, but listen, we are in the the we're in the kickoff. We're in the preseason. We're in the uh, the precursor leading up to the big show. So don't wait, guys, until the curtain is pulled across. Don't wait until the trumpet is blasted. The shout happens, and the voice of God speaks out of heaven. Because if you wait till then, chances are you're going to miss it. 
I know this is old school. Listen, I, I talked to some prophetic uh, ministers that, uh, that are well known uh, on some of these are still on Christian television and we're considered to be dinosaurs in the body of Christ because we still believe, teach and, and preach the rapture of the church. And I would listen, I've heard every argument and angle at this, but I'm going to tell you, this is what I believe. And I will never sway my opinion on this. I've read too much of the word, too much of Newton. I've done Greek word studies. I've done, uh, I've, I've done all of it. Hours and hours of study. And again, I know you may differ, but even if you're, listen, even if you're watching today and you say, well, I don't believe in the rapture and I don't believe in, I don't believe in the catching away. And I believe that we're going to go through the tribulation. Well, listen, friend, even if you believe that, even if you're still here for the rise of the antichrist, the false prophet and the mark of the beast, my Bible says that there will be such deception that will sweep the earth that most of the people are going to die and go to hell. Most of the people are going to pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist and the false prophet. Listen, if people are being forced to do things against their own moral judgment now, what's going to happen when the church is removed and you're going to have to be forced with the decision to accept a system that will put something in your right hand or your forehead, or you're not going to feed your family. You're not going to have a job. You're not going to be able to buy, sell or trade or live because that my friend is what the Bible says is coming down the pike. So even if you don't believe in the rapture, and even if you die a martyr, if you're not right with God, then it was all in vain, and you will stand before the great white throne judgment. And the books will be opened. And if your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, you will be cast, according to this Bible, you'll be cast into the lake of fire that burneth forever and ever and ever. So listen, this is how we're going to end this, this broadcast. We're going to pray, and then I'm going to give you some information, guys, on how to keep up with our ministry and how to follow us. Father, Lord, this is a very sobering message today. And I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would do what I cannot do. Lord, you said your word would not return void, but it would go forth and it would establish and it would prosper that in which it's sent forth to do. I'm asking that the words that I've spoken today, uh, I pray that uh, as they've been inspired by the Holy Spirit, the, the scriptures, the word of God, I pray that they would pierce the very souls of individuals listening on the other side of this camera, the other side of this microphone. And if there is anyone listening today, watching today or both that are not right with you, they know right now that if they were to die today, they would not make it into the kingdom. Their name is not in the Lamb's book of life. God, I'm asking that you would draw them to repentance right now. Friend, I don't normally do this, but I feel led to do this today. Listen, if you're watching this, listening to this today, I want you to lay your hand right here on your heart. Why, why do I need to do that? It's just a, it's a sign uh, that you're surrendering your heart to the Lord. You can put your hands up, whatever you choose to do. If you're driving, don't throw your hands up. Just drive with one hand and put your hand on your heart. I want you to repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, Forgive me of my sins. Wash me by your blood. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Lead me, guide me, and teach me your will for my life. Help me to walk in your ways. Show me what to do all the days of my life. From this day forward, I choose to live for you and not for me. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. Guys, that's a simple prayer. And if you meant that from your heart and not just with your lips, then God will honor that, friend. And your name is now engraved in the Lamb's book of life. And listen, you passed from death unto life. And now 
keep serving him, keep loving him, keep a lifestyle of repentance. If you mess up and you know you fall, just the Bible says, if you'll confess your sins before him, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Keep living a life that is pleasing him, actively pursuing him. And I believe you'll be an overcomer. And I believe that when that trumpet sounds, listen, and there's the voice of the archangel, the shout of God. If he delays his coming and he's and, he, and it's a long while and you go see physical death, listen, you'll be the first to be caught up. If you're alive and remain, you're going to be changed in a moment and twink of an eye. And I'm just going to just throw this out there. If I'm wrong and we're wrong and there's no rapture, friend, you can walk with confidence to know that even if we go through the tribulation and you have to die a martyr, that you may close your eyes on this side of heaven, but you're going to open your eyes on that side of heaven and you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. So guys, listen, God bless you. Thank you again for coming on today and being part of the broadcast. Again, I want to... Uh, I want to show you uh, some stuff on how to keep up with our, our ministry. Again, endtimeheadlines.org, endtimeheadlines.com. That's going to be our main landing page. That's where you're going to find us. Um, I call it the front door and the back door of our ministry. The front door, you can go through endtimeheadlines.com or you can go through endtimeheadlines.org or vice versa. There's two different ways you can get to our ministry. That's our landing page. Uh, please go there, hit the subscribe button. When you get to our website, you'll get one daily digest in your inbox. Do not rely on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these, because I'm telling you, those days are numbered. There's so much suppression and shadow banning that people all the time say, I don't see your post. I don't see things it, again. And that tells me they're not subscribed. And they, and second of all, they don't have our app. Listen, if you download our free app, it's available on Google and it's available on Apple. If you download this and you get into your hands you're, and, you, and you hit yes to push notifications, you turn them on, you're going to get every one of our news and headlines from a prophetic perspective. You're not going to miss a single headline. You're not going to miss one of our podcasts. You're going to get all that right there at your fingertips. So I want to, I want to encourage you to download the app. Again, you can find it on Apple, find it on Google, just type in end time headlines, download that, get it to your hands. You're going to get all that information there as well. And as always, guys, we want to give you the opportunity. If this ministry is a continual source of information, revelation, blessing, encouragement, equipping, whatever the case may be, uh, we want to give you the opportunity to partner with us. Uh, you can become a monthly partner uh, two, two different ways. You can give electronically or you can give by check or money order. Let me give you that information real quick. Again, to give electronically, you can go simply to the app, go down to the bottom. You'll see a place that says donate. If you go to the main website, whether you're on mobile or on desktop or laptop, you're going to see places where you can give and donate through the tabs and places there as well to give electronically. If you wish to give by check or money order, again, you can make that at end time headlines right there on your screen, P.O. Box 1391, Monroe, Georgia 30655. Again, that's where you can find us at our, uh, our physical mailing address, and that's how uh, to give by check or money order. And as always, guys, God bless you, and thank you for coming on today. Now, Friday, this Friday, tomorrow's Thursday, we're going to take off and be back on here on Friday. We're going to do a prophetic viewpoint. I want to discuss a, a major headline, it's, as far as prophecy goes, a major headline that came out uh, involving a major tech giant, um, something that they have now implemented uh, that I personally believe is yet more precursors to what the Bible talks about in the time of the end. So we're going to discuss that on our fr Friday segment coming up in two days. So don't miss that segment again. Uh, until then, guys, God bless you. Thank you. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and may his countenance shine upon you. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.org.